Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to this uh, webinar about Vision Zero for safe construction and safe buildings. Our webinar has attracted a lot of interest with more than 400 participants that follow our webinar via Zoom or YouTube. And they do this with good reasons. Firstly, because we talk about one of the most, and for many even the most exciting industry. It provides for our housing, our infrastructures, our workplaces, our culture and leisure, basically for all parts of our life. We admire new impressive constructions, such as the bridge behind me, which is crossing the horizon between Denmark and Sweden, or as I'm based in Bilbao, our local Guggenheim Museum. Also ancient buildings as the Colosseum in Rome, the Great Wall of China, and the pyramids in Egypt. Secondly, because it uh, also represents one of the most challenging sectors in terms of prevention, as practically all types of occupational risks are present. We talk about temporary workplaces, exposure to harsh weather conditions, the workforce characterized by many migrant workers. We have both micro, small, medium and large size enterprises. Coordination on the construction side is challenging us. There often are a number of different contractors working in power. So Vision Zero seems at first sight a mission impossible. But thirdly, today we have gathered a group of outstanding experts in construction safety who will share with us how they address this challenge to make Vision Zero a reality in this traditional high risk sector. The first part of our webinar will deal with, so to say, setting the stage. Which are the challenges, but also which are the opportunities for Vision Zero in construction? So we'll hear about the safety and health profile of construction industry in Europe. We hear about Vision Zero tools developed by ESA Construction and about proactive leading indicators in construction. After having set the stage, we go to the practice. So we have asked four companies to present their experiences, their business cases for Vision Zero in safe construction. And as the last and third part, we'll hear about Vision Zero for safe buildings. Because as I mentioned, some of the buildings that are created last for a long time and they are used after the construction phase. So we also will look into how can we ensure that the buildings that are constructed are actually safe for users now and in the future. And we have some exciting presentations related to exactly that element. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is a rich program for us and uh, I will now give the floor to my co-moderator, Lars uh, Tornby, who is director at Human House and Lars has been instrumental for setting up uh, the Danish Vision Zero Council. And uh, he will explain a bit more about the council. For me, it's really great pleasure on behalf of the Global Vision Zero Business Council that we organize this event together. And I'm sure this will not be the last one. Also, I would like to tell the audience that you as always have the opportunity to present your questions and comments through the Q&A function on the, on the Zoom platform. And we'll try to address them because we have planned for each of the three sections also some time for questions and answers. But for that, of course, we must keep our schedule and I will try to give a good example and hand over the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, to Lars Tornley. Lars, please. Thank you, Hans Horst, for this uh, introduction to this very exciting webinar. I've been looking very much forward to this day. Um, my name is Lars Tornwig. I am a director at Human House. We are a major authorized health and safety uh, consultancy here in Denmark. And we have also joined the Vision Zero campaign and are working with the Vision Zero mindset for, uh, for a couple of uh, Danish companies. And being a part of the Vision Zero, I'm very happy that we are host and coordinators of uh, a newly established Danish Vision Zero Council where we have the put together a, a group of larger Danish private companies from different sectors who have joined uh, the Vision Zero mindset and movement uh, where we can share knowledge uh, together. And in the, the Vision Zero, Danish Vision Zero mind, mind, uh, Council, we also have uh, two major entrepreneurs 
which I'm very delighted that both of them, uh, NCC and MC Hoigo, uh, Vini and uh, Christian, uh, has had uh, agreed to uh, give an introduction to some of their experience uh, in working with uh, raising the prevention level at the construction sites because also in Denmark, uh, this is uh, an industry uh, where there are many, that's a high rate of attrition and a high rate of uh, many serious work accidents still, still, uh, in spite of we have done a lot of work uh, in recent years in, in Denmark. Um, so I'm looking very much forward to this, uh, to this uh, webinar today. Um, as all this was, what I would like to introduce, start with. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lars. And uh, so, without further ado, we start with the program. As I mentioned, we have part one, which is about uh, looking into some of the background information here from international organizations and some interesting tools uh, that are offered in order to uh, reach Vision Zero. But before that, uh, we would like to uh, hear from Tim Traganza who is a Senior Network Manager at the European Agency for Safety and Health at Work, the EU OSHA, that I'm sure many of you know. Uh, it's actually based where I am, in Bilbao, and, uh, and uh, Tim uh, has, a, has a background in labor inspection, so he has served for a Majesty's uh, Health and Safety Executive, and uh, he has been around uh, at the agency for quite some time, and he has also been part of a campaign that we organized together many years ago, one of the uh, sectoral campaigns of the EU week, Safety and Health Week, uh, because exactly we found that the construction industry needed uh, some extra attention. So it's a great pleasure, uh, Tim, that you join us uh, for this uh, webinar and share with us some of the latest, let's say, data about, uh, let's say, the profile, the risk profile of uh, this, uh, this sector. Tim, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, may I check that you can see my, my screen and my presentation and my hearing is good? Okay, that's good. Thank you very much indeed for that introduction, Hans Horst. Um, it's a long way back to 2000 and I think it was 2004 when we did construction, uh, but it's, the sector remains very important. Now, what I wish to do is to give a very short overview of the sector now, this data comes from a survey called ESNA, which is run by the agency. We surveyed uh, back in 2019, so that's BCE, before COVID era. We su surveyed 45,000 establishments in 33 countries um, to find out what's really happening in these establishments on these sites. Now, for this data, we, to ensure representative samples and to ensure st statistically significant uh, results. Construction is linked with the waste management, water and electricity supply sectors. So um, this is, um, I, I, I make this clear in here, so just so there may be um, a slight broader picture than we can see normally. Um, so if we, if we look here on my slide here, we're saying, well, what are the hazards and risks that we can see in this area reported in this sector? And the first of which, you know, th there are no surprises in this list, machinery accidents, heavy lifting, vehicle accidents. You see, so these are all being very reported strongly. I would suggest here that if you see chemical and biological hazards, only half of the we workplaces here report these. Now, I find that, I suggest that that is an underreporting of these hazards and risks, because I don't know a construction site that doesn't have some chemical and biological or biological hazards in them, whether it's dust or solvents or whatever is, else is being used in the process. I'd also highlight the tiring positions. Perhaps this is also underestimated when we think of even just painters painting ceilings. Um, this may be also an understatement. So what we see is a very broad range of hazards and risks in the sector, but perhaps some are less identified than others. When we look at what's going on in the sector, um, one of the things we see 
is that you know, when we ask people how, how have absences changed in the last three years, we see that most places saying there's not much change. Uh, we're not getting particularly better. And this is particularly true when we look at sickness absence as opposed to accident absences. So this is an indicator that we have to do something a bit better. And when we look at the statistics, only in this, only about half of workplace report are being visited by the labor inspectorate in the last three years. And yet virtually all of them are reporting, they've got the risk assessment and they have a, a policy document, safety policy document or equivalent. So my question here is, if we're not seeing much change in, in this case, uh, sickness or accident absences, yet everyone's got the risk assessments and safety policies, what else is needed here in the sector to improve the occupational safety and health performance? And when we look at what the drivers and barriers to successful health and safety performance are, what we see is very much that legal compliance, the need and desire to comply with the law and avoid um, um, punishment, financial punishment by the labor inspector or whatever, these are big, this is a big driver. So the, the need for legal compliance is the big driver identified in the sector. And yet when we look at what's a barrier to compliance, what we see is that it's not lack of money or lack of expertise. So the question is here, what do we need? What are, what are the barriers we need to overcome to improve the health and safe, safety and health management in the sector? What other drivers, how can we encourage some of these other drivers to be pushing forward the sector to better uh, performance in safety and health at work? So I will, I will provide the links here. Uh, you see that um, all the data I give you, including the visualizations are all online accessible and a lot of it is in 25 languages. We see this data from ESNA is now included in a new um, tool called the Osperometer, which is drawing together data from across the European body. So from Eurostat, from Eurofound, from EU Washer and pulling it together into one coherent data source visualization. So you can go and search and, and compare uh, what is happening around Europe. And I will finally say that we have just launched our new campaign on musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, this is a major problem in the construction sector. And we have a lot of resources and access to a lot of national resources already available uh, on our website. So on this note, I will finish my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, Tim, for giving us this uh, very concise but very clear picture, which kind of confirms now that we have really uh, a lot of risks present, uh, that uh, almost everything is important. Uh, I think these new data or the data you provide are really important to give us uh, exactly that profile and especially also your analysis of what matters in terms of motivation and in terms of hinders now, because this is something that we absolutely have to address also in the Vision Zero, in the Vision Zero context. So thank you, you will stay for us, uh, with us now for this uh, session for the Q's and A's. And uh, now I will give the floor to the next speaker. Uh, and the next speaker is Karl-Heinz Nötel. Karl-Heinz is the president of the ESA section on prevention in the construction industry. You might know that the ESA has a special commission on prevention with a number of uh, sections, and some of these sections are actually focusing on sectors of industries. On, and uh, and Karl Heinz uh, is a very experienced uh, uh, expert in field in this field from his background, which is the German social accident insurance in the construction sector. So we're very pleased to have you here, and especially to share with us. Uh, what ESA's and your section's initiatives are in order to promote Vision Zero in the construction sector. ESA has been uh, the one behind the Vision Zero campaign, so I take it that you are busy developing uh, tools to support the campaign in your sector. So the floor is yours, uh, Karl Heinz, please. Thank you very much, Hans Ost. I'm happy to be part of this uh, conference. And um, my topic, wait a second, I open it. Hopefully you can see it now. Yes. Can you see the screen? Yes. 
Yes, yes. okay, good. Uh, so uh, my topic today is Vision Zero tools developed by ESA Construction. And uh, first of all, the current situation in the construction industry worldwide, we got already some impressions by Mr. Taranatsa. Um, the fertility rate in construction is around 2.5 times higher than in other industries. And uh, I think this is similar all over the world. Maybe some is two, some is three, but it is much higher than others. Here are some typical examples. So for example, in the USA, crane accident in Austin uh, injures at least 20 people, or Germany, scaffolding collapse on construction site, four dead, one injured, or occupational accident, the worker dies crushed by a concrete slab on a construction from France, and the last one from Chile, um, one worker dead, and another with his leg amputated after an accident on a construction site. These are some typical severe accidents which can happen everywhere in the world. And the main accident causes in construction, that was our research all over the world, slip, trip, and cold, number one, ladders, falling objects, electricity, and hazardous substances. And uh, economy is always um, a topic. Fatal injuries due to falls are approximately 20% of all fatal injuries in our world. That means 0.5% uh, economic loss in our world industry. And then very often, I like this picture very much. I'm always asking, do you know when it starts? The first regulation to prevent falls, which are number one. Uh, this is from the Bible, fifth book of Moses. When you build a house, then, wait a second, sorry. Uh, when you build a house, a new house, then you should make a battlement for the roof that you bring no blood upon this house if any man, man fail, fail, fall from them. So, 2,005 years ago, it was the same like we have today. Therefore, we have to ask, are we using the right methods to change the situation? One big problem in the world uh, are, is that we have around 6,500 languages. And, and therefore, our idea was, as ESA Construction, to develop a uh, prevention to pictures booklet online and also printed. Um, because identification of the most common sore points concerning safety and health in the construction industry was the first step. Then drawings of bad examples next to good ones, no written language, can be used worldwide, available for free via website ISAC and ILO. Many, many companies and organizations in the world are using it already. And uh, the start was with 43 scenarios. Uh, I, I give you four short examples related to slip, trip, and falls. I don't have to say anything. I think everyone can understand immediately or hear uh, opening in floors or fall protection on construction floors. And these are like very much on construction, you have to wear a helmet. And you can load it down from that uh, website for free. It's open source, use it. Uh, it's big success all over the world already. And the next step is a construction organized or co-organized several Vision Zero conferences all over the world to improve safety, health, and well-being. Uh, we, we started with it in 2017. We said every conference is under the main topic Vision Zero. One was in uh, Mumbai with more than 1,000 participants. And it was also supported by four other ISA sections. Then uh, two weeks ago, we had an international online Vision Zero conference with OSH Africa. Many African states participated here. And uh, the physical one is planned for November next year. And this one uh, will be supported by six ISA sections. So it's a wide range of interest already now. 2022, we will... Um, organize an international symposium of the ISA construction section in Berlin. And uh, this one is already, um, it's a big interest all over the world to get this after many, many years. What else can we do to achieve a future without accidents and without occupational diseases on construction sites? Uh, we all know the Vision Zero and the Seven Golden Rules. Of, uh, we call it strategy for me. Vision Zero is already a movement all over the world. And it's, it's really a great pleasure to see how, how this is working well all over the world. 
The seven golden rules were implemented in the construction industry via a guideline based on the Vision Zero guideline. And uh, the, the, in this guideline, we implemented uh, the Vision Zero strategy. And there, for example, how to check the seven golden rules. Are they well implemented? You know the rating system. This is part of ours as well. And I uh, don't have to explain it in detail. One example, for example, rule number one, take leadership, demonstrate commitment. So we will ask that the owner client is ultimately responsible for safety. And then you can see, is it like this? Managers demonstrate safety and health, set a standard and serve as a role model, or employees should always feel responsible for their own and their co-worker safety. And we have a lot, of, a lot more of these kind of questions in this checklist. And it is simple, easy, understandable, and usable. It will be soon available. It is finished. And uh, I think beginning of January, you can load it down from our website where you can find a lot of other information regarding construction. Uh, one was also best practices, COVID-19 uh, uh, yeah, in the construction industry. Furthermore, a short version of the application in the construction industry will follow. So we make it more simple for small and micro-sized companies. And uh, the Vision Zero Guide, Seven Golden Rules for Small Businesses will be specified for the construction industry quite soon. Then um, in addition to the guides, a video clip is planned to promote the Vision Zero strategy for construction industry. I think the tender will go out uh, beginning of January. And um, we, we will do it in a, let's say, very specific way, because as you said in the beginning, Hans Horst, uh, construction is a very special industry. Uh, at the end, uh, we will hear it from Pete Kynes later on in detail. We will also um, uh, use these leading indicator guide to specify it for the construction industry and uh, Related to this, we, we have a big, a big project started in India where the leading indicator guide is also part of a rating system uh, together with the government of India. And I think this could be also a new way forward to improve health and safety in the construction industry. Um, and uh, there's a big interest already now. Thank you very much. I keep it short and uh, I hope that you get the first small impression about that, what ESA Construction is doing. It was only a short overview. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Karl Heinz, for this, uh, I think, very interesting and very informative uh, presentation. Um, on Vision Zero tools and some good ideas on how we can raise uh, the prevention level at our construction sites. I'm sure that many of the audi audience will look into the website to, to look for some of your useful tools there. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce the next uh, presentation, which uh, comes from Pete Kynes, a senior researcher at the National Research Center for the Working Environment in Denmark. And for many years, Pete has done uh, a lot of OSH research in the, business, in the building and construction sector. And uh, I think research that has resulted in a number of useful tools. And as Pete is a part of the Vision Zero campaign, as a Vision Zero profile, uh, part of Pete's research has recently had the Vision Zero mindset as a cornerstone in the projects. And today Pete will give us a brief introduction to the results of the latest research on proactive leading Vision Zero indi indicators, and Pete will try to, to uh, put them into the context of the construction industry. Pete, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lars. And have I shared my slides with you yet? I think they're there now. Good. Thank you very much. Yes, I've been doing uh, research in the construction industry for the last 20 years. And uh, often we, when we're looking at indicators for safety, health and, and well-being, 
We often look at fatalities and sickness absence and things like that. And uh, when when the Vision Zero guide was published, the companies, uh, many companies around the world came to us asking, well, what else can we measure that is uh, more proactive and as a better indication of how well we are doing? And this led to this project about Vision Zero and leading indicators for safety, health, and well-being. So this, uh, our, our project derives from, uh, from industries asking us, what can we do? And so within the last two years, we've been out looking at uh, companies around the world, not just in construction, but all industries, small, medium, and large uh, across all sectors, and involving a lot of organizations and finding out what indicators do we have out there that companies are using uh, right now. And most importantly, uh, for, for me coming from a scientific background, what evidence do we have that these indicators uh, have any valid validity in, in predicting accidents? So this is what I would like to uh, provide for you today is some of the results we have from this. If we look at some of the practical examples we have from the London Olympics in 2012, some of the lessons they learned from that were that a visible and impactful leadership are very important. So how could we develop a, uh, an indicator that measures this? As Hans, uh, Karl Heinz uh, presented the, the first rule in the Vision Zero strategy is to take leadership and demonstrate commitment. So this reflects this, this visible and impactful uh, leadership. Can we have a measure for that? Uh, many of you uh, look at near misses and, and using them as maybe an indication of how well we are doing. There's also looking at uh, the briefings. We often call them toolbox meetings or tailgate meetings in construction. And the taking actions on uh, near misses or reports that have been, uh, or suggestions that have come from uh, workers. And the, the last one is recognition, making sure that we recognize and reward excellent safety and health behavior. So these were some of the examples we saw from construction industry. And if we look uh, at the scientific basis for uh, leading indicators, what do we know when we actually look, when we look at all the studies about what's being done in construction, uh, one of the most important studies Looks, which looked at many other studies, what we call a meta-analysis, uh, reveals this, that these inspections and observations, this visible leadership is very important, correlates very strongly with, with safety performance. And these toolbox meetings, very again, another very important leading indicator to uh, safety performance. Other things are many, uh, other things that this, study looked at were that uh, safety record keeping and uh, staffing and involvement and, and training is, are also very important parts of this. So as part of our project, we looked at all this evidence that we have from companies around the world and from the scientific evidence and tried to, to develop uh, some measures for this. And if we look at toolbox meetings, uh, we could have a measure that says, well, do we have a policy that we do toolbox meetings? That could be one measure. We could have a measure saying, well, do we educate and do we train our, our, our managers in toolbox meetings? That could be another me measure. We could also count the number of meetings that we have. How many toolbox meetings do we have a, a, a week or a month? But uh, and up until this point, we haven't done anything to improve safety yet. Nothing's been done on site that has improved anything. And this is where it's important with these leading indicators that, that, that we look at what is being done. And, it, this is, and it's these aspects that need to be measured if we're going to see any progress. So looking at a measure that looks at, do we follow up on suggestions that come, out, come about from these meetings? And do we take action? Do we evaluate them? And do we, uh, is there any learning within this uh, context? And so uh, when we're proposing these leading indicators, we're more looking at these, these last four areas of action and evaluation and learning and follow-up rather than just that we have these meetings. Because as the, the whole philosophy behind the Vision Zero strategy is that 
safety, health, and well-being are integrated in these toolbox meetings. We know that at the toolbox meetings, they don't just talk about safety, health, and well-being. They're talking about production goals, time plans, wages, quality of work. But can we integrate safety, health, and well-being in all in many of the daily and uh, processes we have? Then we're on right. Then we're on the right track, and this is where the leading indicators come in. So we're focusing on this aspect of uh, leading indicators rather than lagging indicators, and we're looking at can we have indicators that are proactive? They occur before a negative events occur, and. Uh, do we have the, the scientific evidence that they are predictive? Is there any scientific validity between be behind these indicators and, be, and behavior and the level of safety? We can look at indicators that look at operations, systems, and behavior. And we want to make sure that these indicators are relevant, not just for uh, the large companies, but also for the smaller companies and across many sectors and that they can be used for bench, not just benchmarking, but also for KPIs for our managers, because that's what they often are measured by production goals, budget goals, quality goals. But it's very rare that there have any uh, KPIs that are targeted towards safety, health, and well being. So we've designed these as uh, leading indicators based on the ESA's, ESA's Vision Zero Seven Golden Rules, as Carl Heinz presented. And we, we, uh, this is provided in this booklet here that can be downloaded from the ESA website and has already been translated into uh, several languages, as you can see here. And here are the 14 proactive leading indicators we've identified. You'll see the number one looking at uh, visible leadership. And this is what we saw both from uh, the practice from the London Olympics and we see in the scientific literature that getting the managers getting out there, being visible, doing safety rounds is very important because in these safety rounds, this is where you get the opportunity to, to have the dialogue with workers and to listen and to work things out rather than hiding behind a desk in an office. So this visible leadership is very important. And so this is, be, this is one of the key uh, proactive leading indicators we're looking at. If we just hop down to maybe uh, number four, we're looking at these, again, what, what do we have scientific evidence for? And one of them, again, is this, these pre-work briefings, the toolbox meetings. These are very important. And it's important that we integrate safety, health, and well-being in these meetings. And that's what we're trying to look at when we're proposing these, uh, these proactive leading indicators. So you can read in the report about all these uh, the total of 14 leading indicators uh, in more detail. And uh, as, as we can see, this is not just relevant for construction. We see it all around the world in healthcare, uh, in manufacturing, and even on the soccer fields. We have pre-work meetings before we start. Is everyone sure about what they're doing today? Are we safe, healthy, and do we feel well? A guide for using these uh, proactive leading indicators are provided in the report. We've, we've written uh, 14 fact sheets where you can see information about the aims, the key concepts, and uh, some good practice towards that, and some suggestions about how could we measure this, because this is the important thing. How can we turn these leading indicators into a benchmark or a KPI that is meaningful for us? So we provide three uh, different ways of looking at this in the report. So I hope you'll uh, in, enjoy reading this report and get and be inspired by it. And uh, just to remember that the basis that what this is all built on is based on practice and science. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. And if, um, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to write them in the Q&A. Thank you, Lars. Thanks a lot, Pete. I like the, the picture of the Liverpool team a lot. You know that, uh, good team, good teamwork, yeah. uh, it's good results. And yes. uh, also many thanks to uh, you, Carl Heinz, and to you, Tim. Uh, we have time for, uh, even though we have a, a tight time schedule, we have, uh, there's room for some questions. And uh, 
I have a question for you, Tim. Um, could you explain to us why legal compliance is both the most important driver and the most important barrier of prevention? As you well, sure. <clears throat> excuse me. I think the issue here is that you know the legal driver as a as a is down to the fact that people come to the site and people are checking on you. So if an employer, if a building site is aware there is a labour inspectorate who is active, then this is the, um, this is a very good driver. We don't want to get a fine. We don't want the site stopped, which we, and that means that time is lost in the construction phase. When it comes to the barrier, the, uh, we see over and over again, not just in construction, concern about legal complexity. Now, the fundamentals of health and safety at work are very, very simple. In the European Union, it says um, the employer protects all workers from all hazards and risks. That's basically it. Um, and then everything else is um, clarification for specific situations. In construction, the, the, one of the challenges is that you have a you may have a multitude of employers um, with different responsibilities and the need for the coordination on the site. And I think this is where, uh, and this is sometimes not clear, who is responsible for what. So it's not just the law, the health and safety law, but there are also building codes, quality standards, contractual requirements and obligations between different contractors. So all these together come to form that barrier. Okay, thank you, Tim. I have just a, 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 a short question also for you. Uh, if the agency, uh, due to the risk profile of the industry, as you presented to us, uh, are you considering a new European campaign or something like that? Have you anything in your pipeline? We, we have recently been campaigning on much more thematic topics so that we can cover as many sectors as possible. The, the downside to having a, a European campaign, and our campaigns are among the biggest in the world, is that uh, if we say we are only looking at the construction sector, we also miss off very many other sectors. So by having the campaign now about musculoskeletal disorders, yes, we can pick up the lifting of heavy loads by workers. We can pick up awkward working positions as, as we see often in construction, but equally we can pick up um, issues such as patient handling in the healthcare sector. So uh, at the moment we have been doing thematic work previously on chemical agents currently on musculoskeletal disorders, which will go on till 2022. This gives us a real strong theme to work in the construction sector. And we do in fact engage strongly with the social partners and expert groups in construction within the European Union. Okay, thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience and the, uh, one of them are for you, Karl Heinz. This is from uh, uh, the Construction Coordinators Organization, uh, it's ish -C -C -O. they are asking uh, how can they tribute to the Vision Zero campaign? Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, this? yeah last, last week, uh, there was, or two weeks ago, there was also an online conference uh, where I was invited by ISHCO to participate and um, we had a wonderful exchange of experience and um, I will have a meeting in January with the president of ISCO to discuss this topic. So uh, maybe if you ask me again, end of January, I can give you detailed answers because uh, we said it is important to work together, ISCO and ISA construction. And we found already some ideas, but this will be discussed middle of January. And I'm quite sure that Mr. Obermeyer, the president of ISCO will inform the members about future cooperation and ideas. Super, thank you. We're looking forward to that, Karl Heinz. Pete, uh, there was a question from the audience to you as well. Um, they are, the, the audience is asking, uh, how come you are not translating this uh, beautiful Vision Zero leading indicator materials into Danish? Is there oh, well, yeah. We are working with some uh, partners, some consultant firms who are very active in using this. Uh, so they are, they are adapting this to making it uh, useful for, for their world, uh, uh, whether they will be 
making other uh, versions. We know the Japanese uh, version is on, on its way and uh, and, and a Russian one as well. Uh, so we'll, we will see whether I can convince the Danes that it's also useful to have it translated here. But we, we do have a uh, lot of consultants around us. There are a lot of partners, uh, part of the Vision Zero uh, campaign. And uh, they, they often adapt and, and uh, the, these tools so that it's useful for them and it's meaningful for them. Uh, and, and as Carl Heinz has been doing with it, adapting it to construction, for example, and making it useful for the, for the sectors that they work in. Whereas the, the one, the, the current version is very, is very generic, it's for all uh, sectors. So maybe, uh, so it's good to see that there's been, there are some ones being developed that are more sector specific. Thanks for your yeah. question. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good point you have there, Pete. The sector, sector specific, as, as you showed us, Karl Heinz, I think it's very useful that the Vision Zero mindset, the seven golden rules, that they are translated into sex, sector specific uh, materials as you have done. I think that's very important, especially to the sectors where, where we have a lot of challenges, as you showed us, Tim, uh, we still have in the construction industry. Thank you very much to uh, to you all three, uh, Hans Horst. I think this uh, concludes the uh, the, uh, the first sector of our our webinar. So I will give the word to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for for this excellent moderation and for this uh, very interesting session. And we saw a lot of interest already, but we have to move on to the next uh, topic. Um, and the next topic, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the next. Now, part of our program is uh, really down to earth. Uh, so we go now to the level of companies and we have four uh, outstanding OSH, senior OSH experts uh, from different construction industries. And uh, the first uh, speaker is Juan Manuel Cruz. Uh, Juan Manuel is uh, the Director for Labor Relations, Occupational Health, Safety and Sustainability at ACCIONA which is a, it's a Spanish company, but it's an international one. And he is currently placed in, uh, in Australia, enjoying the good weather, <laughs> I take it. But I think you're also longing to come home again, which has not been easy for the past months because of the pandemic. So we're very pleased to have you here, uh, Juan Manuel, to, to share how uh, ACCIONA tries to uh, work towards uh, Vision Zero and what you believe are some of the key elements uh, in uh, having this development of the uh, prevention culture based on the Vision Zero mindset. So please, Juan Manuel, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good night on this side of the, of the wall. And thank you very much uh, for having the opportunity to share our experiences, um, talking about uh, safety, talking about the vision zero, talking about how we can change uh, minds and how we can change behaviors uh, to ensure uh, that uh, probably one of the most challenging times that we have uh, been living in the last uh, months and how everything, from my perspective, absolutely everything has changed. Uh, and from a health and safety perspective, of course, the situation is pretty tough, but Thinking positively, I think uh, I believe I really believe that in the next future we will remember this uh, terrible period as a incredible um, jump, uh, an incredible uh, step forward in terms of uh, uh, commitment, in terms of uh, responsibility, in terms of uh, a better approach to health and safety in, a, in at least in our sector. When we talk about uh, when we talk about infrastructures and uh, COVID, uh, we need to understand that uh, construction has been declared as an essential activity in the most of the countries. That probably has been an incredible opportunity to uh, demonstrate that doing things properly, we can keep all our sites working, working in under in serious uh, rules and working uh, probably uh, not only keep our keeping our uh, workers uh, safe but also demonstrating to the society demonstrating to the 
government to the authorities that if we do things properly safety uh, will probably help to avoid the spread of uh, covid and this is a probably a tactical position but also it's a strategic position because uh, we have had the opportunity to change the way we act to change the way we do things um, on sites and the most important question that to change how the people uh, behaviors are uh, uh, doing in, uh, in on sites but also how is the new leadership because the new leadership is just keeping people safe as always but not only in terms of uh, uh, safety operational safety but also uh, creating new behaviors creating new activities and creating new procedures and policies that seriously uh, we believe that uh, probably will change the way we work and the way we for example we access on uh, sites um what what have what what we have done we have done clearly a very very interesting approach because in most of the countries in most of the countries uh, construction has been at least one step forward the uh, the authorities requirements are the authorities and the, the government requirements um at least we have a, and we have a lot of information we will have a lot of statistics but probably today we don't have enough time to share but i'm sure that most of uh, the the attendance at this uh, panel will share with more or less the same information that we have we have fewer cases. We have a minimum name a number of uh, local transmissions, and we don't have, at least in, in our experience, we don't have serious transmissions on sites. And what what we have those incredible figures. We we have those incredible figures because we have created immediately. Uh, new procedures and we have implemented new procedures and we have created not only uh, a sensibilization campaigns but also a new leadership based on collaboration and based on self-responsibility and the results are there the result is that at least in our experience we have more than 1400 sites all around the world and only in those countries that the governments the governments decided to stop the activities, we have uh, we have maintained the activity and we have maintained the activity with a very 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 incredible results. And this is quite important because probably in the next future we can we can um, we can use those experiences to uh, incorporate this new leadership this new compromise this new commitment and this new cooperation not only uh, with our uh, employees with our workers with our uh, managers but also we have subcontractors we have with our uh, collabor uh, collaborative in, uh, in a typical collaborative uh, approach uh, to improve other risks and to manage other risks in the same way that we have managed that because we have uh, we have a clear demonstration that we can do things better that we can create commitment that we can create safe environments and safe uh, sites safe jobs safe positions for everyone uh, just a few examples that we had to share for example here in australia we have tested everyone every week on site and no one has refused no one no one refused uh, to be tested because everyone everyone had clear commitment that be test track and isolate if was necessary is the most important thing that we can do but it's not only a matter of uh, test track and tracing of course it's probably just an experience the most important thing is how mentalities how commitment 
how responsibilities has absolutely they, they have changed everything in, uh, in our managers At, for our perspective is the most important question and just to finalize this uh, brief presentation uh, because i think we have some uh, issues uh, sharing and uh, screens and i have a video but probably we can share later um talking about this uh, committee and talking about this leadership i would like to briefly explain what happened in our offices as you probably know we have been working from home i don't want to well i'm not sure if we have been working from home we have been working for everywhere we can <laughs> i think it's quite different this is not an um, this is not a, a real experience of uh, working from home. Probably we need to learn a lot of things about working home, from home and a lot of uh, challenge uh, related to health and safety. But finally, we have decided that everyone who is able to attend at the offices, uh, they should attend. And why we have decided that? Because seriously, we have made in really, really important investments to create safe environments, to create safe positions, to create safe um, sites, and to create safe offices. And we can declare that at this moment, we have uh, almost 7,000 people in Spain, in more than 148, 149 uh, sites, and we haven't had any case of local transmission in our offices and at this moment we have 100 percent of our uh, um, employees 100 percent of our overheads of course excluding uh, high risk people uh, but 100 percent of uh, our employees are in the offices and this is again an incredible example of how leadership how commitment how self-responsibility uh, can help us to create safer environments. Um, and the main reason has been how we can translate to our people in the offices that we have more than 80% of our employees are working on sites, are frontline workers, have been working probably the most dangerous environments are hospitals and a lot of uh, really, really um, uh, risk environments. And People in the offices has clearly assumed that going to the office, keeping a safe environment is in the office, and be committed with the new safety rules, with the new safety procedures, is again another uh, part of our responsibility as employees in a company and just minutes. working together. Two minutes left. Okay, okay, no, no, I, yeah, it's just, uh, just to finish. Uh, Again, um, we have had an incredible opportunity to reinforce leadership, to reinforce commitment. And for our perspective, this is probably the most positive approach that we can share in this, uh, in this panel today. OK, well, thank you very much, <laughs> Juan Manuel, um, for joining us from Down Under and for sharing uh, your very interesting uh, experiences, no? uh, which already show that things sometimes work differently when you are on the ground. No? And uh, I'm sure there will be questions related to uh, how you have achieved this uh, new management commitment, but also to your practices as regards uh, teleworking and working in the office. Very interesting, thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker uh, is also from the Asia Pacific region. We are very, very <laughs> to have uh, Mr. Takashi Kawata with yes. us. Hi. Kawata. Good, good morning and oh. good evening. <laughs> uh, please allow me to share my screen. So just to introduce uh, Mr. Kawata, he's a standing advisor of uh, the Shimizu Corporation, a major um, international uh, construction company based in Japan. So the floor is yours, please. Mr. Hans, can you see? Can you share my screen? Okay. Mr. Hans, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Well, thank you for giving me uh, this good opportunity 
Uh, my presentation title is Reducing Operational Risk in Construction Through IoT. But I think so that the safety assurance at the site is not only technology of robots, but also the person's mind of risk management and control. So my presentation has two items. One is about the technology of robots and another one is about the awareness app. Now I will explain the trend in the number of obsessional fatalities in Japan. The blue line represents all industry. The red line represents the construction industry and the green chart the represents the number of fatalities in tunnel construction. In 2019, there were 845 casualties in all industries and 269 in the construction industry, accounting for the more than 30% of the total. In addition, the number of the fatalities in the past 30 years has decreased to about one third. But for the last 10 years, it shows very gradually or no decrease in trend. The key to improve the productivity in construction industries with the promotion of eye construction. To improve the productivity in construction industry, as well as creating a safety and attractive work site. We are now trying to address the labor shortage by inducing, introducing in I construction and the safety 2.0, which includes collaborative safety. This figure shows the data integration between worker and the machinery where supportive protective system can be utilized. In order to operate this one site, it is necessary to continuously integrate the entire system, including risk information that changes in a highly risky construction environment. This is an overall view of Shimizu Smart Tunnel in mountain tunneling, which utilizes the approach of safety 2.0 to increase safety within the tunnel. The aim is by acquiring and analyze comprehensive digital data within the tunnel in order to make risk prediction from subjectively to objectively. Information guidance is provided using advanced sensing technology and high-speed information communication system. Details of Shimizu Smart Tunnel of overall connection to digital platform were shown here. By installing sensor and positioning tag at the tunnel face, workers and machinery, various information can be acquired and read out, carry, uh, carried out in a confined space with multiple heavy machines working efficiently together. In addition, in order to achieve efficient construction, the size of heavy machinery is getting larger and larger. And the blind spots from the operation operators are getting larger. In the unlikely event the people come into the contract with the heavy machinery during the marking operation. It could lead to the serious action. 
This is why we at Shimizu Construction have been able to maintain productivity without compromising work efficiently. Efficiency. The purpose of this program is to eliminate accident involving people and heavy machinery during marking operation. We have introduced a safety management method based on the cooperatively safety of people and heavy machinery. It is it says safety 2.0, and we could get the safety 2.0 certification of this March. The Takimuro Zaka tunnel was the first tunnel in the Japan to be certified for safety 2.0 in the construction industry. In order to achieve safety 2.0 and combination of human and heavy equipment position management systems, warning and lighting control system, heavy equipment information transmission system, and heavy equipment uh, parameter uh, surveillance camera systems are used to reduce the risk of the accident involving contract between people and heavy equipment. In the sh shedding area during shedding operation, operation. Let's take a look at each element of technology. The supervision put transmitters on the workers' helmet to keep track of where they and their heavy equipment are in the tunnel. It also has a receiver in the tunnel, which automatically alerts workers and heavy machinery that approach the tunnel face without permission. Okay. okay, so when the operator moves away from the vehicle, large the revolving lights come on to alert the operator and the person driving the other heavy equipment to the danger. Also, when working in the vehicles near the tunnel face, the sequence lights with turn on to alert the operator of heavy machinery to the larger, but it is difficult for them to notice the, the other workers. Two minutes left, Mr. Kawata. It is necessary that the data intelligence between worker and the machinery where supportive a protective system can be utilized in order to safety 2.0 come through at the technical field of construction. We have been thinking about that the increase of safety consciousness can widely be known by a textbook of easy to understand like manga. We conducted a survey on items one to 10, which is shown by the table to evaluate the effectiveness of safety 2.0. And here are the results. The blue line represents before safety 2.0, and the orange line present, represented after. Here is a more detailed look at the uh, of, of, of four mentioned result. The left side is a result of the prime contractor, and the right side is a 
result of the non-prime contractor. Next, I will explain of Shimizu Smart Site application. The Shimizu Smart Site is a collaboration of the automated robots equipped with AI and B BIM, which is a 3D building model. Please watch how each robot moves. The materials carry on to the robot, robot body. Body finds the frame, gloves, and the material and install them. Okay. Next, there is how our robots are working on the site in comparison to the traditional way to working. Left side is traditional, and right side is a robot, robot body. In the material transportation, we usually require the two men to the drag and the pallet of the gypsum board. Robot carrier can carry it uh, themselves. Cooperate together with one more carrier at the top, even the as auto mass elevator. Here's a welding welder sitting a stack of wire reels. His chair because he has to keep in position during his welding. Right side well, robot welder can work all day long and not get tired. Here is our third robot named Robo Body. Let me show you how a construction worker install a heading board. This isn't, isn't a protocol, but the support dip some board with his head and the left hand. We keep the screens in his mouth and the, he uses an electric drill. Okay, so this picture shows that you can see everyone has very great looking because this is a breakthrough ceremony picture. And I think so that the construction field will be the best safety and healthy industry. Yes, well being. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Takashi, for this uh, very exciting and informative presentation. I think uh, you gave us some very good examples on how to work safely uh, with heavy machinery in confined spaces and also have uh, people there. Uh, and also I find found it very interesting your, your presentation on how robot technology could uh, reduce some of the severe risks that we have on different kinds of work in the, the, in, in the sector. So thank you very much. Takashi. And uh, now uh, it's my great privilege to introduce uh, Christian Köhler Johansen. Uh, Christian is uh, head of the health and safety at NCC Denmark. NCC is uh, one of the major entrepreneurs here in Denmark. And uh, in addition to being head of uh, health and safety, Christian is also a member of uh, this newly established Danish Vision Zero Council. And uh, Christian's, uh, the title of Christian's presentation today is co-creating co healthy and safe workplaces and preventing accidents. The floor is yours, Christian. Thank you, Lars, and thank you for having me. I will just see if I can share. So just let me know if you can see anything. It's working fine. It's all there? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, my plan is actually to give a very short and very fast introduction to our health and safety value chain. That is kind of the framework we use uh, when we think about health and safety and how it adds value to, to our production. 
And then I would like to highlight the three core activities we have found to be very central in, in the way we want to put health and safety on the top of the agenda in our production. Oh, now it, it goes a little fast, I think. What do you see? Let me try this one. Okay. Just let me know, do you see a fine model of a uh, blue wheel and uh, coal? Yes, we okay, do that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, this is our health and safety value chain, and it's a model we designed to illustrate the framework we have for our work with health and safety. It differs a little from uh, business area to business area uh, and country to country, but uh, the principles uh, behind the models are the same. In the core here, we have our values, our code of conduct, and, and in a health and safety perspective, it's represented by our health and safety living rules. Uh, it's uh, think ahead, take care of each other, and speak up. Our living rules are kind of a reference point we use a lot in our communication about, around health and safety. In the outer ring, uh, we have our, you could call it obligations. Uh, the, the first four, uh, the first five, uh, in a more legal perspective. And the, the last one, the sixth, is uh, more related to our commitments in uh, different uh, circumstances and also our certifications according to ISO. So safe work conditions. Um, creating safe work conditions has to do with uh, making the right foundation for our colleagues to do their jobs. Uh, it's a lot to do with uh, creating the right, uh, right platforms. Uh, planning and organizing is, of course, about setting the scene and making sure that uh, we have the right infrastructure and logistics are in place and uh, the, the different uh, uh, tasks are, are probably coordinated. Appropriate equipment has a lot to do with our obligations to be on top of uh, the technological uh, development in our industry but also our responsibility to, to make full functional technical aids available at the workstations on site where it's needed. So it also has, uh, looking back in planning and organizing, it's not just uh, having the right equipment, but having the right equipment at the right place and, and making, uh, making way for our guys to, to actually be able to use it out there where it's necessary. Instruction and training, of course, uh, has to do with making sure that our colleagues uh, has the right skills to do the jobs, uh, but also uh, our obligation to set the scene and making sure that they, they have the right priorities during, uh, during that specific job they're doing. Supervision and coaching is, uh, of course, our obligation to follow up on the work being done, that it's being done as agreed during instruction and also that our colleagues stay healthy and safe doing it. And uh, evaluation of best practice, of course, are related to our vision and commitment to, to continuous improvement. Uh, part of that being also our continuous search for new inspiration and sharing of best practices. Then uh, we have an inner ring in this model also, and this is actually what makes it all happen. Uh, our leadership and management on all levels uh, here represented by our star behaviors. Uh, star behaviors are our way of promoting the mindset we strive for in, in NCC. Uh, the first one here, act with care, is key to our approach and, and a clear incentive to integrate health and safety in the way we work and take care of each other. It's very much related to uh, creating safe work condition and also to, uh, to the planning and, and organizing uh, processes. Act with passion to perform is, is our way of uh, highlighting that the planning and organizing and using appropriate equipment is not just about health and safety, but also about uh, productivity and, and cost efficiency. Build together is, says it all about, you know, empowering, empowering and engaging uh, calling, colleagues in, in sharing knowledge and best practices. Uh, but also you know, to take care of each other and speak off if there are risks, uh, re referring back to our living rules. And uh, follow through and follow up talks a lot about being disciplined in our way of working uh, through supervision and coaching, of, co of course, uh, but also by aiming for continuous improvement. Within this framework, uh, we have uh, lots of processes and activities going on. 
And, and the three I would like to introduce here is, uh, is uh, some of those uh, core uh, activities we have uh, very regularly going on on every project uh, to, to uh, actually combine a sort of workflow from, from planning to production. Uh, first up is our production uh, planning meetings. Uh, in these meetings, uh, we focus a lot on involving frontline managers. Those are the guys out there setting the agenda and, and uh, very often uh, has a very large impact on, on the, the quality of health and safety uh, in the, at the workstations. So we want them to be there and we want them to uh, take health and safety uh, on top of the agenda. Um, so, and, and, and the way we do it in, in practice, it, it can sound very simple, but it's actually extremely important that they take turn in, in standing, uh, standing up, uh, going to the screen in uh, the room. It can also be more analog with uh, the with whiteboard or whatever, but, but standing up and going there and sharing their plans they have for the coming week. Uh, of course, uh, they meet up very well prepared. That is, is one of the things we have learned. And, and they have uh, done a lot of consideration about challenges and risks and, and how they plan, it, uh, plan to manage those. But actually, uh, we also found out that, that doing that preparation, they start talking a lot more to uh, the colleagues and to uh, the workers. Um, and so, so this, uh, we found, was a perfect setting for, for feedback, uh, you know, when you're standing there uh, sharing where am I working in the next week, how am I planning to do it. Then the other guys who have also worked tasks in, in uh, related areas or in the same area even, uh, they will start discussing with you, well, if you do this, uh, in, uh, start over here and, and uh, you take care of the, the noise this way or this way, then it might be a challenge for us and we need to find another way of, of uh, solving that. So we actually experience a lot of uh, feedback uh, from, from the other uh, managers, but also uh, a lot of problem solving, uh, where in many other uh, cases in the old days, there was a lot of going to the site management, discussing, we can't be there, what are we going to do? Now they actually solve that challenge in the meeting. And we have also made a, an approach that, that if there's a problem that is difficult to solve and it takes a lot of time, then we take it out of that meeting and we take it out onto the site after the meeting. And then uh, in our experience, when you're out there on site, looking at the challenges, it's very easy to find the right solutions. And when we have found the right solutions, we report that back into the meeting and, and uh, the minutes from the meeting. So it's, it's brought on um, uh, forward. Yes. The weekly safety briefing is uh, about involving all workers on site. Uh, the weekly briefing is, is usually held on Friday where the, the production planning meetings are usually held on, on Thursdays. So uh, it has to do a lot with uh, what happened this week. Uh, what observations or incidents have you been reporting into the, the site management? We have a uh, digital reporting systems where we report uh, negative, positive observations, near misses and, and accidents. And, and uh, so there's a feedback here uh, to the guys. Uh, you have been reporting this during the week and we are taking care of it like this and this and this. Uh, also uh, taking the, the uh, decisions uh, from the production and planning meeting and bringing that to the attention of, of all workers on site, sharing uh, plans for the coming week. Uh, are there any changes in the site layout? Are there any high risk areas uh, to avoid? Uh, and, and how can this impact uh, different works uh, at site? Again, uh, for us, it turned out to be a perfect setting for, for feedback, but also uh, because, uh, you know, the guys get very involved. Of course, there's somebody just sitting around drinking coffee and just listening, uh, but there's also a lot of guys and an increasing number of guys participating and, and uh, getting involved in, in uh, you know, fine tuning some of the decisions that has been made or challenging them, even if it's necessary. And again, uh, uh, this, as I said, perfect, uh, yeah, two sorry. Minutes. Yeah. Again, a perfect setting for feedback and, and engagement. And that brings me on actually to the last um, uh, activity we have, a daily safety briefing. Uh, this is uh, for the team, uh, the team with your colleagues. This is uh, 
where you discuss what are the work we're going to do today, what are the risks and challenges, are there anything from the weekly briefing we should be aware of, uh, avoiding high risk areas or using other access roads to our workstations. Uh, but most important, actually, it's, it's stopping up before you start working, look each other into the eyes and agree on working safety today. And especially when we are onboarding new uh, colleagues on uh, site, it's a very uh, important activity. So yeah, that was it for me. Uh, a quick tour. And if you want to like, uh, dig a little deeper uh, and, and share experiences, feel free to, uh, to reach out also after the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian, for a very uh, interesting uh, presentation. I think uh, you, you showed us uh, in, in, in brief uh, your systematic approach to, uh, to how you uh, look and how you uh, conduct your, your risk assessment in, in, in due to safety, health and, and well-being. And very interesting, your presentation of your proactive uh, health and safety activities. I think you showed a lot of good up examples on how involvement with the workers can change culture i think uh, exactly uh, and it is a culture builder but it's actually also making our production more efficient and, and so it's it's a great benefit it's a win-win <laughs> win-win yeah thank you very much thank you and the next uh, presentation i'm very happy to introduce you to uh, vinnie Sonke Heimann. Vini is Vice President uh, in Quality, Health and Safety and Environment at uh, MT Heuko. MT Heuko is also uh, one of the major uh, entrepreneurs uh, here in Denmark. And uh, Vini is also one of our members of the newly established Danish Vision Zero Council. Uh, the title of Vini's presentation today is uh, Leadership and Constant Focus Pays Off. Vini, the floor is yours. You need to unmute. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to join you today, and I'm looking forward to show you what uh, I'm. Uh, I want to present uh, to to uh, tell you about in my presentation. Uh, I have a different uh, approach than uh, you had, Christian. I. Uh, will focus more on the activities that we have made from the management to, uh, to uh, keep the focus uh, uh, for several years now. And um, uh, so it's more about the uh, activities uh, um, uh, from, from Central. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, MT Heuger is a part of MT Heuger Holding. Uh, we are one of uh, the Nordic region's uh, leading construction companies and we have projects in Denmark and selected locations abroad. Um, our history goes back uh, 100 years. We solve different types of tasks, but we are especially known uh, for the uh, large and complex building and infrastructure projects. And um, we have more than 1,500 uh, employees and more than 700 of them are hourly paid carpenters, concrete workers and uh, bricklayers. This slide shows where we currently operate uh, our head offices in Søborg, close to Copenhagen in Denmark. At MT Højgaard, safety is uh, at the top of the agenda for everyone, and the management leads the way and shows commitment to the process. Uh, we signed off on a vision of zero accidents back in 2013. And we have focused even more on safety since then. Uh, this has resulted in a significant decrease in our accident frequency, especially in the number of serious accidents. As uh, Hans Horst and as, uh, um, and as you said in the beginning, Hans Horst, uh, 
we uh, we know uh, we have um, the surroundings change all the time. We dig deep holes and we lift heavy elements with large cranes, and we drive heavy trucks around with materials. And our employees are used to working in this dangerous environment, uh, but they do not always see the dangers around them. And that's why everybody at all levels has to make a huge effort to prevent accidents. Uh, they all have to stop and think about their own safety every time they start on a new task. And uh, we have managed to get all employees to focus on the work environment. And we have created a safety culture where we take care of each other and uh, we are known for having a safe work environment. Um, here you can see our uh, accident frequency. Uh, we have managed to uh, uh, lowering the accident frequency to a level which is uh, significantly below the industry average of uh, 25.4 and uh, we are very proud of that. Um, unfortunately, our accident frequency has increased this year. Uh, and this is due to an increase in the number of minor accidents in the first quarter of the year. We have taken steps to prevent this from happening again. Um, and the accidents were located in, uh, in one section. We, um, we vary our initiatives and activities as much as possible so that things don't become routine. Uh, we have, for example, introduced uh, e-learning, uh, health and safety weeks, and safety timeouts. And as you can see on the picture, we once made a board game about the work environment. And the small uh, helmets we made by our own uh, 3D printer. In this game, uh, all our employees at the construction site uh, sat together. They threw the dice and uh, they talked about safe and unsafe situations on their own site, uh, what they were good at, uh, where they could do better. And this resulted in valuable discussions about safety and uh, they ended up with a conclusion of how they could increase the safety on their construction site. And they sent the conclusion to uh, my department. All, employee, em, all employees uh, must complete an uh, e-learning course when they start at MC Heuko. Um, you go through five modules and the course includes MC Heuko's requirements for working in a safe manner. When you finish the course, you get a blue sticker for your helmet. <laughs> in the spring of 2014, we launched uh, Health and Safety Weeks. These uh, health and safety weeks uh, are planned in close collaboration with the construction sites and uh, the health and safety weeks have been a great success because they have led to the focus on work environment uh, that we needed. Uh, we have through the years had a lot of different activities uh, and what you see here is examples of uh, these Activities. Also started using pictures as uh, Karl Heinz mentioned in the beginning. Uh, we have made an animated film. Uh, this animated film shows some of the dangerous situations where we have been uh, given immediate improvement notices by the Danish Working Environment Authority. And it's important for us to avoid uh, these situations because they can develop into serious accidents, of course. Uh, the animated film was produced without speech or text so that everyone can understand it regardless of their nationality. Uh, and we want to ensure that our hourly paid staff do not expose themselves to these dangerous uh, situations. Uh, we also want to remind our construction management uh, and supervisors to stop dangerous situations 
uh, when they see them in order to prevent accidents. We do this to make sure that everybody knows that they have a shared responsibility um, to take care of themselves and, uh, and each other. Uh, three years ago, we uh, introduced a safety timeout. Uh, they are held on all construction sites every second week. And uh, they help us to ensure constant focus on safety. With the safety timeouts, we prepare our supervisors for their direct communication uh, with their hourly paid employees and uh, uh, on, on specific topics. Uh, this can be new legislation, uh, immediate improvement notices from the Danish Working Environment Authority, for example, uh, PPE, as you see here, or it could be um, fall protection or new requirements uh, from top management or, or uh, yeah, from us. Um, like one of the seven golden rules of Vision Zero says, we identify hazards and control risks, and we do that by incorporating these current hazards uh, into safety timeouts and health and safety weeks. Um, we often ask our supervisors uh, what topics they need us to address at the safety timeouts, and it gives us a very valuable collaboration with our construction sites. This uh, large last slide uh, is from the Maldives, where we celebrated uh, one year without accidents, and. Um, I, I wanted to show you the things we are working with uh, from management and from our department. Uh, and that's in top of uh, the daily uh, uh, activities on the construction side where we, of course, have the planning meetings. Uh, uh, we have uh, instruction, risk assessment, uh, toolbox, toolbox meetings and uh, uh, stuff like that. But uh, but on top of that, we try to keep the focus by having these activities uh, um, from time to time. So, uh, so we all, uh, always keep the focus. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I wanted to tell you about. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Vinny, for your very interesting presentation. And I think we have had four very uh, interesting presentations. Focusing on certain aspects, no? Juan Manuel was focusing very clearly on this leadership experience, no? The commitment of leadership, what this has moved during the pandemic in particular. Mr. Cavata has focused on technology, no? I construction. We're not surprised as Japan, no? <laughs> they are the leaders in robot production. So uh, this was uh, very, very interesting. Christian talked about co-creation and this uh, importance of uh, involving management and management and uh, the employees in a systematic way and involve them in creating safe environments and and you uh, have just explained how the safety culture has been built uh, with this vision of zero accidents. So thank you all of you for, for this uh, contribution. I have uh, a couple of questions and if you'd be kind to ask answer them as brief as possible. <laughs> so the first for you Juan Manuel, if you are on again, he had some problems connecting, so I'm not sure that he has made it. No. So to Mr. Cavata, I know yes. <laughs> one, of, one of the problems now that are behind your drive towards uh, uh, safety 2.0 and introduction of new technology has been your problem to recruit, especially young people, to work in construction. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and my question to you is, with the introduction of all these interesting gadgets now, uh, yeah. and these technologies, has this motivated young people again to search to your sector and be part of being an operator in this type of environment, of this type of technology environment? Thank you for your question. So the, in these times, uh, uh, in Japan, I already experienced that young people don't want to work sighting uh, in our uh, uh, construction site. So in these times, uh, this uh, technology uh, introduced the site. Site one people want to the uh, very interesting that that's the technology. So I believe 
So the uh, in Japan, so young people uh, will be uh, in, uh, will increase uh, uh, enter to our consul site. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, also for answering very briefly, uh, Christian, a lot of issues now, um, and uh, I cannot but ask you to say where do you see because I asked what is really driving uh, Vision Zero, so improvements in safety behavior. And you mentioned all these interactions and the structures you have established, the wheels, the value chain, which I like very much. And I like especially the center of it, not when we talk about the humans and the interaction to create the culture. So to your experience so far, since you have introduced this model, what has been the critical element? What has been really decisive in achieving the successes that you have seen? I think the, the, to keep it very short, the critical element is to align it, to make it business oriented. Uh, and and uh, everything we do and the way we communicate our decisions and our approaches and our initiatives are aligned with our strategic direction. And I think that's very important that we have that mindset, both when we uh, kind of, you know, design the initiatives we make, that they make sense in, in that framework, but also that we can uh, kind of, you know, hook on to some of the, some of the energy that is always in the strategic uh, processes so, so when we put a health and safety perspective on, on that agenda, it, it generates a lot of energy that we can profit from. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Vinny, I have a question which was not directly uh, directed to you, but comes from uh, uh, an audience in, uh, in Africa. And uh, uh, this person observes that uh, often multinational companies, so like yours that have activities also in Africa and uh, other countries, they, in his view, do not observe the same, the same rules. And uh, often there is a pressure uh, because working is uh, really crucial for people to survive. And uh, so they feel maybe weaker than in our Scandinavian or European context. So you showed us just an example that you celebrated on the Maldives uh, one year without accident. So how do you achieve that? What is critical in order to not only in Scandinavia, but also, uh, let's say, in totally different environments, which maybe are more vulnerable. How do you ensure uh, your vision zero of accident uh, philosophy there? What is important there? I think it's it's uh, it's uh, all about focus and uh, and and uh, leadership. And uh, we have, uh, I think, we are. Uh, a lot better than our competitors, uh, comp competitors, as I call that, uh, in the Maldives, and uh, they always wear helmet and safety shoes, and they they have the mindset that they have to take care of themselves, and um, and they actually they are better than we are sometimes because they don't uh, work as fast as we do sometimes because. Uh, it's, they are not as expensive as uh, uh, our people in Denmark. So actually we have uh, some very good traditions in the Maldives as well, but uh, we have some competitors down there that doesn't take that much care of their people. So I think it's focus. If I may add to that, because I think that's interesting because uh, Christian just focused also on that, always the other side of the equation is also the productivity of the business success. Yeah. So, so focusing more on health and safety, for example, mm -hmm. in PPEs and others, uh, I, it might increase uh, the cost. Of course, it's not the same as, as in Denmark, as you say, but nevertheless, so have you seen a competitive advantage in, in, uh, in that, in maintaining high levels, high standards? Mm -hmm. or is this yeah, I think it goes together. So I think uh, if the safety is good, uh, you're also uh, uh, more productive. Thank you. May I ask, uh, Mr. Cavata, um, now that you have achieved this uh, fantastic safety 2.0 certificate, what's the next step for you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So in this time, we are getting the tunnel uh, site. So next time, we will get the uh, civil smart site, building section. Okay. Yes. And also, in that time, the, okay, it is a, a goal, not go, not, not goal to the, get the certificate of the safety 2.0. Uh, every day, we will Im, uh, no, improve the, how to the, getting the safety, safety uh, uh, management. So also, the, uh, my, my dream is uh, uh, 
construction site is the best uh, industry uh, site in the world. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well. Well, uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues. And just continuing with this uh, in 2022, yes. there will be a Vision Zero Summit uh, yeah. held in Japan. Yes. And there will be a combination of a virtual no, and a physical presence summit. So this could yeah. be a invitation you could give us now to that we can come and see in practice now how your eye construction is working and how this is working and how you have improved even further from the 2.0 uh, level. I think that could be yeah. a very case. I, I hope so. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> so we, we, we take you by your word there. <laughs> so <laughs> with this, uh, I would like to close this uh, second part of our, uh, of our webinar and go to the final, but not less exciting part, because now we are going to talk a lot about design, about, you could say, predictive safety and health. So how can we make sure that uh, the buildings we build, the, um, that they are safe for the users, that they think safe uh, uh, into the design and construction phase already. And uh, for this, I have uh, the pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Vincent Yong, who is the principal consultant of the Occupational Safety and Health Council of Hong Kong. And uh, we're very pleased to have you with us, uh, Vincent, because all of us who have been to Hong Kong know that construction there uh, is a very, very special, <laughs> special business uh, because of uh, simply the space that is available and we're all impressed about all these high-rise buildings and very, let's say, integrated approaches to, to, uh, to construction. So we are very eager to hear how you are addressing this issue of building in a safe way, not only during the construction phase, but also for the users. So the floor is yours, uh, Vincent. Hey, uh, thank you very much for your introduction. So uh, first of all, I would like to share my slide first. Uh, good afternoon. It is a great pleasure for me to attend this webinar. And today I would like to share with you how to promote the vision zero through the design for safety. And before I start, I would like to introduce our council Occupational Safety and Health Council is a statutory body established by the government in 1988. And our role is to promote the occupational safety and health standard in Hong Kong and also cultivate a strong safety culture. We have also launched the Vision Zero campaign in Hong Kong in 2018. And fans hand host to be our officiating guests for the event. And up to now, we have more than 20 organizations they have signed up to promote the concept of the Vision Zero. And we will continue to promote this concept in various centers in Hong Kong. And next, come back to the topic on the design for safety. The first question that I want to ask, is it difficult to achieve safe design of the buildings? Why I ask this question is that because usually when the designers, they design the buildings, they will first look for the aesthetics. That is whether the appearance of the building is attractive. However, will the designers also consider the health and safety of the practitioners who will use or operate those buildings in the future? And that is why I see that it is very important to promote the concept of the design for safety because it allows early involvement of all the stakeholders, such as client, designers, and the contractors, and they can work together to eliminate or minimize the risk in the subsequent stage of the construction, operation, as well as the maintenance. And in order to promote the concept of the design for safety, our council has worked actively with the Development Bureau, which is the client of the major infrastructure project in Hong Kong, and we have designed the guidance notes and also the work examples of the design for safety. So how to start the design for safety process? And from here, you can see that it can be divided into different stages, such as the design stage, tendering stage, construction stage, and also the operation and maintenance stage. And in the design stage, you can see that all the stakeholders, such as clients, designers, contractors and the final end users, they will arrange a brainstorming meeting so as to reduce 
or minimize the risk in the subsequent stage of the construction, operation, as well as the maintenance. However, if it is not reasonably practicable to eliminate all the risks, then the designers will specify those residual risks in the pretender health and safety plan, such that in the tendering stage, the contractors can propose some good construction methods so as to minimize those residual risks. And next, I would like to show you some of the examples on the design for safety solutions. And from here, you can see that this is a joint user complex of the government building. One of the safety concerns during the design stage is that the workers need to clean the windows and also watering the plants at the external wall of the building. So there is a risk of the falling from height. So in order to minimize the risk, the designers has designed a maintenance corridor on the external facades so as to improve the safety condition and access for the workers during the clean window cleaning and also the maintenance of the greeneries. And this is another example for the Hong Kong Indoor Velodrome Come Sports Center. This is a world-class cycling facilities which can accommodate more than 3,000 audience. And one of the safety concerns during the design stage is that there are lots of the ceiling mounted surfaces including the fire surfaces facilities and also the lighting system. So how to ensure a safe access to these uh, ceiling mounted surfaces is not easy. And finally, the designers has come up with design solutions to design the catwalk and also the maintenance platform. And all these uh, maintenance platforms are prefabricated off-site and then lift up by cranes for the installation. This can help to minimize the use of scaffolding during the construction stage. And at the maintenance stage, the workers can use this uh, maintenance platform for the safe maintenance work. And next, I would like to show you some of the design for safety initiatives for the housing authority, which is uh, one of the major clients for the development of the public housing projects in Hong Kong. And in order to promote the concept of the design for safety, the housing authority has set up a design review committee so as to approve all the safe design practices. And next, I would like to show you some of the examples. And uh, on the left hand side, you can see that barriers are provided at the canopy so as to prevent the workers from falling down when conducting the cleaning works. And on the right hand side, you can see that access stairs and the working platforms with guardrails are provided for the workers to conduct the maintenance work in a safe manner. And this is another example for the provision of the railings along the edges of the green roof and also along the edges of the covered walkway. And during the design stage, usually the designers, they will prefer the design options of using the railings instead of installation of the full arresting system. Because uh, all you know that using the full arresting system is a last resort and there are lots of the limitations. And next, I would also like to show you some of the design for safety initiatives for the private buildings. And our government has required the developer to provide common means of access for the maintenance and repair works. And from here, you can see that some of the examples include the provision of the gondolas for the new buildings, and also the provision of the maintenance access ladder for the safe maintenance work. And also in this photo, you can see that the installation of the wall mounted outrigger so as to facilitate the future installation of the gondolas. And finally, the design of the casting anchors for the workers to anchor the safety harness so as to provide a safe means of access to the maintenance and repair areas. And next, I will also like to show you uh, our new requirement for the safe design on the air conditioner platforms. And from this photo, you can see that we require the roof of the air conditioner platforms should be at least 900 millimeters so as to provide adequate working spaces for the workers to carry out the maintenance work. And also suitable guardrails need to be provided for the air conditioner platforms so as to prevent the persons falling from height. And also I see that nowadays uh, there is a trend on the use of the building information modeling. And uh, one of the advantage is that through the building information modeling, the designers can generate three-dimensional digital model of the building structures 
And by using the BIM, it can also facilitate the designer to come up different design options so as to enhance its application on the design for safety. And next, I would also like to show you an example of improved safe design in a e-waste recycling facility. Because uh, in order to enhance the recycling of e-waste, our government has entered a design and build and operate contract with a reputable German company, Elba. And during the design stage, Elba has proposed uh, lots of the safety initiatives, such as uh, from on the left-hand side, you can see that the design of the robotic arms for the automatic cutting of the fast screen display so as to minimize the risk of the workers. And in the middle, you can see that this is an uh, ergonomic design for the provision of the anchor flexible equipment for the workers to dismantle the recycling materials more easily. And on the right-hand side, you can also see that the design of the conveyor belt to transport the recycling materials so as to reduce the manual handling risk of the workers. And I can also see that there will be a change in the design of the building facilities because of the COVID-19. Say, for example, for the office building, you may need to redesign your ventilation system so as to increase the air changes per hour to ensure a high level of cleanliness. And besides the air, air ventilations, the factors of the temperature screening, social distancing, and also, also a better design of the drainage system, this will all affect the future design of the building facilities because of the COVID-19. So from all these examples that I show you today, you can see that there are lots of benefits for the design for safety. And most important is that if you can get it right for the first time during the design stage, the safety implementation will be much easier and the cost of implementation will be much lower because it reduces the needs for the redesign and retrofitting. And finally, to conclude, if we need to promote the design for safety, we need to promote uh, early involvement of all the stakeholders, such as clients, designers, contractors, and also the facility management. If you can involve them in the early risk management in the design stage, you can help to enhance the buildability, usability, and also the maintainability of the buildings. So that is the end of my presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vincent, for, for another very inspiring and exciting presentation. And now in another area, the uh, health and safety for the users of the buildings after they have uh, after the construction phase. I th think you gave a, a couple of very good examples on both for the people who may who operate the building and maintenance, but also a very good uh, at the end examples of. Uh, predicting health and safety impacts on the users of the building and how to incorporate them in the design phase. And, and I like your quote, get it right at the, the first time. I think that can save a lot of money and a lot of uh, hazards uh, for the users of the building. So thank you very much, Vincent. And now uh, I would like to present Lars Hoffman. Lars Hoffman is head of uh, the EHS Expert Center at Siemens. And uh, I know Lars has a colleague with him. I think Lars, you should introduce him to us. And your title today on your presentation is a digital twin technology, predictive safety and health. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world. Thanks Lars and thanks on host for the kind invitation and introduction. Uh, and also thanks for having the opportunity to, to support this kind of event. Um, I really enjoy it and I hope that uh, the topic will be interesting to you. Uh, in preparation of the meeting, Hans Horst and I had an exchange on what could be interesting for you to know. And uh, since uh, the Siemens core business is digitalization and automation, um, we decided that it maybe makes sense to, to give you some examples how it the digitalization here, and especially the digital twin, can also support the subject of uh, prevention. And therefore, we decided to show you three examples. 
uh, I've invited one of my colleagues. He's an uh, internal scientist and researcher in the te technology department. It's Dr. Wolfram Klein. I hope he, he can hear me and he is joining via telephone because he has some, some difficulties. Uh, um, and he would uh, guide you through the examples we are going to show you. Wolfram, can you hear me or can you hear us? Lars, I think he needs to unmute. You need to unmute your, your mic. He needs to unmute the mic. And so also, I don't know if, if we can unmute uh, the mic. On on uh, on Wolfram. There's the opportunity to unmute. I think it's uh, ah, it's uh, working. Yeah. Okay, I think it works now. Can you hear me? Yes. Can yes. you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Very good. Uh, so maybe uh, Lars, can you show my presentation on your screen? Is that fine for you? Yes, it's fine. So perfect. So thanks a lot for, for the invitation and for the possibility to have here a talk at your, at your uh, webinar. My name is uh, Wolfram Klein. I'm working at uh, Siemens Technology in the field of research in digital and automation. And especially, I'm working in the field of simulation and digital twin. And this is also our topic of, of today. Last, next slide. So our focus is the um, digital twin. Of course, there are several digital twins. Uh, we can talk about uh, digital twins in the in the uh, product for production plans. We can talk about uh, digital twins for for mobile for mobility or for trains. Today, I want to talk about uh, digital twins for buildings. So the building the building twin is in the center of our discussion, but we are not talking about only about the digital twin itself. We are not working only with the digital twin, with all this data, with all the semantic. We are really applying the digital twin. And we are applying the digital twin with respect to different simulation services. And here we could talk about simulation services, for example, for energy simulation of buildings. We could talk about the simulation of the building automation. But today, I want to talk about the pedestrian stream simulation. And here, of course, I want to talk about these three Ws. When can it be applied to the stream simulation? Where can it be applied? And of course, why? What, what is the benefit of all the other things? Uh, why should it be applied? And therefore, I would talk about the three uh, phases here. I would to, like to talk about three examples for the design phase, for the operation phase, and the, for the corona situation. And on the right hand side, uh, the question is how to, how to construct the building twin this digital twin, so uh, how to get this building data, and of course, how to get the person data. So we are also talking about the life cycle of, a, of the real building and the life cycle of the digital twin. So let's start with the design phase with the next slide. I want to show a very concrete example, which is say, the it's industrial hall of Audi. So we were talking here really with Audi, or more concretely, we were talking with the with the architect, with the planner of that building in the design phase. And uh, this uh, yeah, architect planner uh, had some, some very nice questions. So the principal idea was, you can see that on the picture on the left-hand side, uh, it was given a building with three levels, and the first two levels are for the real car manufacturing of, of the Audis. But the idea was on the third level, to have on the third level a very huge meeting room. And they wanted to have quarterly meetings of 5,000 people every three months within that, uh, within that meeting room. And now one question of the, of the architect to us was yeah, really simple and then very, very clearly. And uh, of course, a valid question on the left-hand side, how many large stairs do I need or do he need in, uh, in order to evacuate 5,000 employees safely? So do we, do we need four staircases? Do we need five staircases or even more? And this is really just very clearly um, a question of safety, of, of the security, of course, and of money. Of, it's, it's clear one staircase more costs several thousand uh, euros or dollars more, of course. 
But this was uh, this was not the only question. On the right hand side, you can see some some smaller staircases at the western part and at the eastern part. Um, also on the big picture on the left hand side. And the his question was, what is the influence of the smaller of the smaller staircases to the entire scenario? Even especially if this uh, one one smaller staircase in, is in the near of the kitchen. Or what, what about for fire brigade people or for ambulance people or medical people in case of fire? How can they enter uh, this huge meeting room? And furthermore, questions in the middle, the pictures in the middle. What about uh, reordering of the seating? What about persons being at the terrace outside, having only one smaller door? And even talking at the right-hand side, talking only also about disabled persons. So he wanted to have 20 disabled persons and their um, assistance and then how to evacuate uh, persons with wheelchair safely out of that huge room. This is one one question, and I think it is clear the design of a building really affects the behavior of persons. So this is the, the design phase now going on into the operation phase. Here I want to talk about the platform at Frankfurt Main Station. Here the interesting thing is not only to talk about the building itself, but here we are talking about person data. So we are talking about person data in the current situation, so for the current time point, but also for the for historical data analysis, for historic person data. So and there are also a number of questions arrived on the left hand side, where is the platform with the maximum density, where are the most frequent persons incomes or leaving the entrances and then the, the targets, what is the influence of delayed trains? But all these questions now, relative to the time, that means all these questions have to be answered differently if it is, let's say, Monday morning rush hour or Monday evening or Monday uh, lunchtime or even at the at the weekend. Yeah, That means all these questions are really depending on the time. But we all, uh, do not want to analyze only the historic person data but the, or the, the current person data. But the very interesting question is here at the left-hand hand side at the bottom. It's also interesting to make a prognosis into the future. Yeah, to make a prognosis of the future per person behavior. That means we are talking about the next, yeah, let's say, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or half an hour, something like that. To make a prognosis of the prognose uh, of the person behavior, in order for the facility manager to arrange his his personal staff or to arrange uh, to arrange delay trains or something like that. This is the operation phase. Going to the next slide, and of course, the operation of a station can clearly improve the uh, can be improved by the stream simulation. Going to the next slide, I, I think you are all aware of this very strange and, and, and situation of Corona just now. You are all aware of it, and we have a, a certain regulations with respect to the distance and uh, and the number of contacts and the number of duration time of contacts. Here I want to talk about a very simple uh, museum scenario, which you can see on the left-hand side. And the idea is we have a museum with five uh, exhibits in cell, uh, itself being uh, arranged in a circle. And we have on the left-hand side in the orange rectangle, we have the income of the persons. And now the question is, what is the best arrangement of the person streams to go from one exhibit, from, from one sample to the, to the other, to the next sample? Is the best way, as shown in the very left scenario one, to, to have one huge group going from, from left to right, or right inside uh, one exhibit after the other? Or is it better in the middle to have scenario two, where we have two groups, or we have several groups of, let's say, 30 persons, and to mix these groups and then to go group by group, or on the right hand side is the best way uh, to have a counter current flow where we have <clears throat> two different person streams. One is going to, uh, coming from the left hand side and the other person stream is coming from the right hand side. And the answer is for that scenario, we can really simulate that. And the best result is scenario two. Best results means with respect to number of contacts or with respect to the duration time of these contacts. Yeah? We can really simulate all these uh, or these scenarios. Now, here, uh, up to now, I talked uh, a little bit about the different life cycle phases of the digital twin. Now the question is, of course, where are these data coming from? So the uh, one, one question is, uh, where are the building data coming from? And the next question is, uh, where are the person data coming from? So let's talk about the building data. Here we have to differentiate uh, between two different approaches. Um, either we are talking about uh, greenfield approach, 
newly built buildings or we are talking about brownfield um, buildings, that, that means uh, yet, yet existing buildings. Um, and here, uh, one way is for newly built buildings, we can talk about BIM, of course, with IFC data, we need a converter, how to come from BIM to our simulation. Or if we are talking about brownfield buildings, we can use here this uh, 3D scanner, or maybe even we can use PDF plans to identify the symbols or the walls or the staircases on the, on the PDF plan. Another way around is on the next slide, to talk about the pedestrians. So the question is how to get the input of the pedestrians. And here we can get the pedestrian from different sources. That means we can get, uh, we are talking with video data or RFID data or even mobile tracking to get the, the interfaces, to get the person data. And we are analyzing that in, in the, the historical data. You can see on the right hand side, for example, a certain velocity profile or this origin destination matrix. And the idea is really here to generate a corresponding simulation scenario. Uh, and then at the, at the very end, as I said before, really to, to make a prognosis of the future behavior depending on the different um, environmental conditions. So at the end, I hope this was a very rough overview. At the end, I, am, I want to point out again, why should we do that? Okay, the, co the goal of our, our uh, pedestrian stream simulation is of course, uh, to predict the critical crowd densities or even to have a prognosis, a model-based prognosis for the future, for the future pedestrian di uh, dynamics. And the, there are a lot of different application cases concerning the offline design, as I said, or the offline planning, as I said, but also in the, um, in the and, and this can be also confirmed by regular authorities. Uh, this can be trained, but also an online forecast. And we have a tool here at Siemens, which is based on yeah, certain, let's say, mathematical methods. We are using the cellular automation with, with several yeah, mathematical elements, let's say. And even we are taking also uh, into account environmental context, environmental impacts. So we are also able to, to simulate a fire or a smoke situation within a building and to, to couple that to the pedestrian stream behavior. I hope this was a very rough overview to the entire topic. So thanks a lot for your for your time. Thank a lot. Thank a lot for your contribution. And uh, if there are any questions, of course, I'm I'm open for that. Thank you for your participation. Do this now. You. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, thank you very much, Lars, and uh, thank you very much, Wolfram, for this. Uh, I think very uh, interesting. Uh, presentation on how simulation can be used to predict uh, different kinds of health and safety uh, impacts. I think the example of uh, the uh, risk of contamination with the uh, coronavirus was a very good example and very, it's an example and an issue that concerns all of us right now. So uh, thank you very much. I think uh, our Great. time, thank you. Uh, time is uh, slipping, so I will skip uh, the q and I'm sorry, uh, but, uh, and, and we'll go to the, uh, the conclusion because um, I think we are at the end of our very exciting webinar and I don't know about all the audience, but uh, I think, for I will give the word to you, Hans Ors, I feel very inspired. I think we got a lot of good uh, examples. First of all, I think this, uh, we heard of uh, at this webinar shows that there's still too many, much too many accidents and attritions in the in the industry, and uh, I think we got a very good examples on uh, how some of the keywords for me actually is uh, a systematic approach, an overview of uh, the risks, um, and keep it simple at the same time. A very difficult task, I think, uh, and I think involvement. There were very many good examples of, of, of that um, for both leaders, uh, visible leadership and, uh, and employers. So uh, I think there's a, a big job ahead of us how to raise the level of prevention uh, towards a, what I would call a prevention culture in the construction sector. And I think uh, the presentations today showed a lot of uh, inspiring tools and a lot of business cases and a lot of good examples on how uh, 
the use of the vision zero, seven golden rules, uh, can be used on this journey. So I think uh, what I've seen today is that for sure, vision zero and the vision zero mindset and the seven golden rules uh, could be used uh, on the journey towards a higher prevention level in the construction sector. So uh, hands off, would you uh, take the word? Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for this excellent summary. Um, as I said, we, we, have, uh, we deal with a fascinating sector. Now it's uh, really impressive what is done by construction companies and uh, one can only be full of admiration uh, for what is achieved. But it's at the same time also a sector that due to its special nature is causing a lot of harm still. And therefore I think it was, a, I have a very positive conclusion of this, uh, but I'm also an optimist. I think when you work in prevention, you have to be an optimist. And I, I see a lot of uh, lessons learned here. I think uh, the, the justification for having this, uh, this webinar, this type of webinars is very obvious now, bringing together both, let's say more policymakers and uh, organizations that think at the global, international, regional level, and uh, bringing them together with the uh, practical people, people that work on the ground. And I think that's something that we uh, should do uh, even more in the future to exchange so that there is a kind of feedback between these two layers. So the concept of vision zero and the tools that have been developed and the data that is available that can be used also proactively within the company. But then also this uh, fantastic development when we talk about uh, technology. And this is why I was very, very happy to have both uh, uh, Mr. Cavatas, but also uh, Lars's and Dr. Klein's uh, contribution today, because this sector is also changing rapidly. And uh, the other day I saw, happened to see at the, during the news program that in Germany, they are now building uh, entire uh, apartment blocks uh, through uh, 3D, scan, uh, 3D uh, printers. So it's a huge 3D printer, which is printing the entire building. And uh, so, uh, so I think uh, also there is a, is a future, like for others, that will be positive now in the sense of taking off a, a lot of heavy work, but also bring some new challenges that we have to address. And these new challenges we capture there, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, prevention measures that still have to be improved. But I think we had some very, very clear messages from, uh, from the companies on how this can be done. And uh, I really would like to congratulate, especially our four representatives on the company level, because at the end of the day, it's your work that, that counts. And, uh, and it, I'm really impressed by, by your you know, efforts and your energy and your commitment towards making this happen. I hope also for you, it was interesting here to hear other companies, because this is exactly the idea of both the Global Vision Zero Business Council, of whom Shimizu and uh, Axiona members, and of course, the new Danish uh, council that we welcome a lot and we hope that more will follow. So with this, I simply would like to thank uh, all of you, uh, in particular those of you who presented uh, for your also discipline to present within the very short time slots we gave you. Uh, also the audience for the interesting question that were put forward and sorry if you couldn't answer all of them, but, uh, but I think uh, that it has been worthwhile and uh, I look forward to future activities together with, uh, with the Danish Council. Uh, just at the end to mention for those of you that haven't had the chance to watch the entire uh, webinar, uh, it will be published uh, uh, on YouTube, so you will have access to uh, sending also a link if you think there's something that your colleagues should know or your business partners should know, there's an opportunity also to promote that because it can be accessed also at your own time. So with this, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Lars. Uh, I think it was really fun to uh, co-moderate with you. And uh, once again, thanks to all of you and, uh, and stay safe. <laughs>